today's Compass Summit looks a, a lot different from our past conferences, not only because it's being held virtually, but because we're spending much more time diving really deeply into investor perspectives on racial and economic justice, as well as um, surveillance capitalism, capitalism and the impact of COVID-19 on the workforce. So it's, it's going to be a great day. In the first weeks of the COVID outbreak, RFK Human Rights um, understood that the most vulnerable, among the most vulnerable uh, to Corona were those in overcrowded jails awaiting trial, not because they had been found guilty of any crime, but simply because they did not have the financial resources to pay for their bail, to pay for their freedom. In one case, we bailed out a woman for $25, $25 in unpaid parking tickets. And she's in jail pre-trial facing a death penalty because of corona. This is insanity. We bailed out people in jails across 10 states in the first two weeks of March. Then we partnered with Colin Kaepernick's Know Your Rights Camp and committed over a million dollars to support local bail funds and community organizers in their work to free people from being put into cages only be, be, before they be even had their day in court. We documented many of these stories to hear more about how the pandemic has compounded the human toll of wealth-based criminal legal system. And you'll see some of those videos today. And just a few weeks ago, we joined a coalition of human rights and social justice organizations to testify before the Inter-American Court for Human Rights on uh, a hearing on structural racism and police violence in the United States. Sunda Duckett, CEO of Chase Banking Solutions and RFK Human Rights Board member, noted that COVID-19 has impacted the economy in devastating generational ways, but that's often not reflected in the stock market, which, as everybody on this call knows, is a reflection of the future. With the Dow Jones has risen steadily over the last six months, regaining its earlier losses from COVID, unemployment remains at 7.9%. And the permanent unemployment rate, the percentage of people who have been unemployed for 27 weeks or more, has increased by 781,000 human beings from August to a total of 2.4 million Americans in September. With the impact of COVID, most especially has thrown into sharp relief in our country is the great distance between rich and poor in the United States. That's why today's discussions on racial injustice and economic injustice and the nexus of the two are so vital. The net worth of a typical white family in the United States is $171,000. $171,000 for a white family, 10 times greater than that for the average black family, which is $17,000. Gaps in wealth between black and white households reveal the effects of accumulated inequality and discrimination, as well as differences in power and opportunity that can be traced back to this nation's inception. Perhaps nowhere is the wealth and race gap more apparent than in the $70 trillion investment industry, where women and minority-owned firms invest just 1.3% of the assets under management. All of the rest of it is invested by old white men. Half of America is unemployed. Relationships between black communities and American financial institutions are terrible at best with hurdles to access to capital and credit, as well as major disparities in wages, positions of power, and pathways to success. 
the St. Louis Fed found that between 1992 and 2016, college-educated whites saw their net worth increase by 96%, 96% increase for college-educated whites, while Blacks saw their net worth decline by 10%. Of 47, of 4,700 banks in America, only 21 banks are Black-owned and led. The total assets of Black-owned banks is $5 billion, less than 1% of the $20 trillion in total assets at all commercial banks in the United States. If we are serious about addressing those issues, even if we waved a magic wand and fixed all the policing issues in our country and all the criminal legal systems, mass incarceration in our country, it still wouldn't do anywhere near enough to fix the financial services sector. Our Compass Investors Program has released a concrete plan that the investor community can take to better the lives of Black America. I hope you will all take a look at that plan. We've sent it, we've emailed it to all of you. Please take a look and and decide what you can do, what pieces of that plan you can do in your lives as investors and as philanthropists and uh, as purchasers. This is why we are delighted to gather you all today, because we believe that change cannot come without the leadership of the people on these panels and in this audience. And with that, I'm delighted to introduce our opening panel. So we have Jose Feliciano, who's the co-founder and managing director of Clear Lake Capital. Tom DiNapoli, our great dear, dear friend and the controller of the state of New York. And John Rogers, also on the RFK board along with Jose, chairman of co and co-CEO and chief investment officer of the aerial investments. So let's begin um, with acknowledging it's been five months since George Floyd's murder and the first wave of racial protests this year. So Jose, Clear Lake made some big commitments this year to diversifying the organization and investing in specific businesses. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, sure. And Kerry, Tom, you know, John, great, great to be virtually uh, with all of you. Um, yeah, obviously, this has been a you know, very challenging year uh, in the context of a pandemic. Uh, and then, you know, in the, the backdrop of the George Floyd murders, um, did open up a, a conversation. You know, as horrific as that event was, it did open up a conversation uh, about a lot of the topics that we're going to address uh, in the conference. Um, it was also an opportunity, for example, for us, you know, and, and for myself to uh, <clears throat> to take action and, and, and do that, you know, kind of a pur very purposeful uh, way. And I think one of the things um, that you touch on is, you know, kind of the, the whole issue of uh, access to capital and and you know, kind of justice, you know, kind of in the on the on the capital side. Um, the short version is that you know there are a number of things that I think we can all do, and then we're going to talk about that. You know, but one of the things that we identified, you know, very early on, um, and that you know many of us have been talking about for a while, but again, there was a window of opportunity here. Is um, uh, we need more people that look like us in in the boardroom uh, because that's where the decisions are made. That's where a lot of the capital allocation is made. So one of the things, for example, that we did is we partnered with one of our portfolio companies. Um, and other private equity firms in an initiative to have more uh, diverse board members, for example, in our boards. Uh, you know, we, we control 30, 40 companies. Each one of those companies has two or three board members uh, that are coming outside of our organization. And that's a real opportunity to give, uh, you know, underrepresented minorities, women, a, a first, a first or you know, in many cases, you know, repeat experience as board members and that experience could be a springboard to public company uh, board memberships and other opportunities out there. Uh, and you're seeing a way, particularly here in California, in terms of, you know, again, a focus on that representation on boards. So that's one aspect of it. 
The other thing that we did is, you know, personally, I have been investing for a while, but, you know, kind of reinforced that effort and, and, and reinvigorated that effort in other funds that are led by underrepresented minorities and women. And I think that's, again, uh, another very important uh, thing that we can all do. But I'm happy to talk more about it. But that's a little bit in a nutshell in some of the things we have been doing. Okay, thank you so much, Jose. And then, uh, John, moving on, can you have a very specific approach to bridging the wealth gap, the three Ps. What exactly is this? And um, how has this approach been implemented in companies or organizations with which you've been involved? Oh, well, thanks so much. Um, three Ps started uh, from a conference that uh, Ariel has sponsored uh, along with Russell Reynolds and Charles Tribbett going back over now 18 years. Uh, Deloitte's become our partner and it's a conference for African Americans and Latino directors of publicly traded companies. And so over time, what we've decided to do is to be able to have people leave the conference with some instructions because we feel it's really important for those of us that are in the boardroom to fight for not only social justice, but economic justice once we're in that boardroom. And uh, every year we have, at the conference, we have a conscience of the conference, someone to remind us that we have the responsibility to fight for each other in the boardroom. So we've had Congress, the late Congressman John Lewis. We've had Harry Belafonte, who's on the board, of course, here at RFK. We've had former Ambassador Andy Young, Reverend Jackson, Reverend Sharpton, <laughs> President Obama, Valerie Jarrett, Eric Holder, to remind people that we have to speak up and speak out when we see things that are not fair and not right. So the three Ps are, we want to measure three things. One is philanthropy, try to get publicly traded companies to give more and more of their donations to civil rights organizations and those that are working for, for fairness in our society. Secondly, to measure the people, of course, making sure that you're getting senior diverse talent into the C-suite on the management committees and measure that, hold management teams accountable, uh, should affect their pocketbook if they're not making progress on the people aspect. And then finally, the third is purchasing. And we think it's so important for, for all institutions, nonprofits, as well as corporations, to follow the lead, frankly, of what uh, Tom has done with the state of New York, to have a program that works with minority-owned companies in everything that we do, in professional services, in financial services, in technology. So what we've asked all of our directors to do is keep track of the purchasing by category. So that's the best way to do that. So you're not just going to do the a supply chain, which is important, but to be able to do with everything that's being spent in that organization. Uh, Exelon Corporation in Chicago does an extraordinary job of this. The University of Chicago has been magical. And of course, McDonald's has the longest history of working with black franchisees and, and, and black suppliers and all the things that they do, black advertising agencies uh, to black financial services companies. So those are the three Ps and why it's so important. And Hopefully, it can take off around the country and minority directors can talk about those three Ps in boardrooms everywhere. You know, thank you so much, John, for sharing that with us and especially for giving us those examples of a major corporation like McDonald's that's really actually putting this to work as a model for the rest of company, for other companies. Um, John, that was a great segue over to Tom. And Tom, you have long championed the importance of investing in diverse managers at your pension fund. Uh, tell us more about that strategy and the impact it's had on your fund and amongst your diverse managers. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. Thank you for uh, really setting the context for this conversation. It's great to be with uh, Jose and John. Clear Lake and Ariel have been uh, wonderful partners with us here at uh, New York Common. You know, I would say that uh, in the aftermath of, of George Floyd's killing and everything that's come after that, it, we've been looking inward. And, and I, you know, I think our first uh, most important takeaway is whatever we've done, it hasn't been enough. You know, and, and I think that's the context of, of how we're doing pension fund management and really our work all across uh, the divisions of the state controller's office. So while I'm, I'm proud of what we've done thus far, we, we really uh, are trying to redouble our efforts. So, you know, I'll just mention a, a combination of things uh, quickly in the interest of time. First of all, we continue to put a priority on having a diverse internal staff. Uh, that's very, very important because uh, although we're a large fund, uh, over, over half of our uh, investment portfolio is managed internally. 
you know, so so having a diversity uh, and and you know, we're asking others to be diverse. We want to make sure that we're diverse as well. I'm very proud of the fact that uh, the three CIOs that I've hired have all been women. Two out of the three uh, have been black women, uh, and that's made a difference in terms of setting the tone and, and how we approach these issues. We certainly, uh, you know, picking up on, on both what Jose and John said, are using our investment power to press companies in terms of diversity on uh, the board of director level and uh, in terms of staff. So we've reached out to, uh, in recent uh, weeks, all of our external managers really re-emphasizing our sense of priority on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've targeted uh, 74 uh, of, our, of, our, of our public companies that seem to have no diverse managers and really raising the issue of what they're going to do to change the pipeline of, of directors. And then in terms of our own capital, we continue to uh, expand our efforts with our emerging manager and MWBE uh, investments. We're up to now about $7 billion in our emerging manager program. Most of those relationships are with, with women or, or uh, firms or firms of, owned by people of color. $20 billion uh, in total for uh, MWBE. We've uh, now expanded our staff that works on emerging manager and MWBE on the investment side. AJ Hernandez, who many uh, on this conversation may know, uh, we've added two additional investment professionals to work with him because you need the staff resources to continue to build out those numbers. And the way we've tried to encourage a pipeline uh, has really been focused on our annual emerging manager conference. I'm sure many on the call have participated uh, in that. So I'll just put in a plug that we're going to be doing it virtually, which is the world we're living in now. It's going to be on February 10th, 2021. You know, obviously we'll be advertising it. You can check out our website for how to sign up for it. But that really has been a key way for us to identify uh, new investment opportunities, to develop uh, new partnerships. And I, I you know, I, I really think we, while I say, you know, we're, we're pleased with what we've done so far, we very much view what we've done as the floor and not the ceiling. And we don't have a top line goal. We just know we all need to do much more. And we're looking at some new platforms. I'll just wrap up on this. But I think one of the issues is not only having investment partners in terms of, of their ownership that is diverse, uh, particularly with regard to, to, to black and, and Latino ownership, but I think the, the, the other piece that we need to look at, and my friend Bertha Lewis from the Black Institute has often sounded this call appropriately so, where is the money going that we're allocating to diverse managers? Is it having an impact within local communities? And obviously, you know, we particularly look at that from a New York perspective. So we're actually looking now at, at some new opportunities uh, to develop uh, platforms that deal with economically targeted community investments, particularly for black and Latino neighborhoods, to have our capital go to diverse managers who will then allocate further, particularly for small businesses and entrepreneurs, in, in black and brown communities. So uh, we got a lot going on and we need to do more and we wanna be part of the conversation. Thank you so much, Tom. And you know, you've really been a leader, especially in the, in the public realm on so many of these issues that we've been speaking about for uh, a dozen years now and you've made a huge difference. I think it is important to point out that there's a, uh, there's a difference between diverse managers and emerging managers. Emerging managers, of course, um, uh, don't don't need to be diverse at all. So um, those are th those are two different issues, both very important issues. Um, but people from diverse backgrounds face both the diversity issue and the emerging managers issues. So thank you for, for bringing that to the fore. I wonder, Jose and John, um, Tom has, has laid out a few specific things that investors can do that are really concrete. Could you give us your two or three top uh, steps managers could take today to, or it's rather investors could take today to create change on um, specifically on the issues around Black Lives Matter? Okay, 
Sure. Sure. Take it. Well, I, I think as, as you've talked about this idea, and, and, and Tom just talked about it, the idea of creating wealth uh, in our communities. We all know that um, that financial services companies make more money. They have higher margins and traditional supply chain opportunities. So it's so critical that as you build up a, a, a a group of successful minority-owned money managers, you're going to be hiring people in local communities. We'll be able to create our own philanthropy in our own communities. We'll be able to be politically empowered in our own communities when we have more welfare. Mm -hmm. It's not lost on me in Illinois that our governor is a venture capitalist. Our last governor was a, a private equity person. We know, it'll, we know in New York City how uh, the mayor was someone in financial services and technology. So it's so important that we build these types of leaderships, leadership opportunities for people of color, because then we'll ultimately be able to, uh, as we create more wealth, we create more jobs, it will help us in this time of Black Lives Matter, because we'll be showing people that we believe in Black Lives by giving them economic opportunities. Um, one of the things that I often talk about is that Dr. King, um, in his life talked about progressive white Americans will often deplore prejudice but accept or ignore economic injustice. And we know that economic injustice causes the type of challenges that we face in our urban communities today that brought rise to Black Lives Matter. So the work that Tom is doing and others like the Knight Foundation under Alberto Ibargman's leadership and Juan Martinez and some of the other institutions we've talked about are really making a difference in our society by creating opportunities for all of us to build our own businesses. Exactly. Okay. Thanks, John. That's that's really helpful. And uh, Jose, yeah, I think, two I think, or three uh, things that people could do concretely. They 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 hear this discussion. They say, "I'm going to, I'm going to change today." What can they do? Well, first of all, I want to you know, command you know, uh, Tom, the controller, and 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 New York State because I think they their model. Uh, is a great blueprint for what other people can do. So, so first of all, um, you know, one of the things that we hear a lot about is, well, we, we're not finding, you know, kind of the right opportunities. We're not finding the managers with the right uh, experience. You know, and, and I'm here to tell you that, you know, putting Clear Lake aside, there's not a Clear Lake commercial. There are many people. You know, you just heard the statistics about, you know, kind of New York Common, how, you know, the the, the amount of capital that, that they have deployed in these type of, you know, with these managers. And by the way, this is not sacrificing performance. That's the other thing that I would say, right? You know, the performance um, in this category has been as good or better uh, than than the performance on the overall funds and the overall market. So, so number one, um, it is not a pipeline problem, right? You know, there are opportunities out there, both at scale and both as well as small opportunities. Number two, you can set up, you can call it what you will, emerging manager programs or not, you know, around or in the context of that emerging manager program is that the, the route that, you know, kind of an, a, an LP decides to take, I will highly encourage you to do what you do in your regular uh, investment bucket, which is that, you know, you try to basically double down on the winners, you know, and by that, I mean, you can co-invest, you can set up an emerging manager program and have a separate amount of capital that you can co-invest additional capital to the winners, to the great performers within that portfolio. And then the last thing is, there are plenty of organizations, uh, and we can certainly help in identifying those for, for the group, but organizations like the Twigo Foundation or SEO and others um, that have done a great job of harnessing the young talent out there that's black and brown and yellow and all and you know women and, and and there is a pipeline out there of great young talent that already has uh, investment experience, that already has financial services experience, and hiring those people matters. Because as we all know, you know, we tend to invest and we tend to hire and we tend to associate with people that perhaps look like us or at least that we have something in common with. Um, and expanding that network uh, by providing opportunities, both employment opportunities, access to capital opportunities, investment opportunities, that's something that we all can do in small and, and big ways. So I would encourage everybody uh, to pursue that. And that's something that you can do today, you can do tomorrow. Uh, and again, if anybody has you know, questions or would like to access some of the pipeline, I'm sure uh, Sancia, for example, can provide a list of, you know, kind of great managers uh, in the space. You know, I'm sure New York Common, 
you know, will be happy to facilitate. And it's actually public information about, you know, the people that have been participants and recipients of, uh, of commitments from, from their emerging manager programs and, and their program overall. So I think these are all things that we can all do. I'll just give you a quick anecdote. You know, we have been hiring uh, diverse uh, talent for a long time. You know, I, I, I have a theory, I have a hypothesis uh, that talent is equally distributed in, in society, right? You know, talent, investment judgment doesn't have a gender, doesn't have a color, doesn't have a sexual preference. Um, and now over 10 years of doing that, you know, summer interns that we hire, Twigo, SEO, I think there are four or five of them that over the years have gone on to be partners now and founders of uh, investment firms. So, so there's not a pipeline problem um, we all work really hard to find great opportunities on the investment side. There's no reason why we shouldn't be looking equally as hard to find talent. And that talent may look a little bit different than the talent that we used to hire before, but that doesn't mean that that talent is any less. Uh, and, I, and I think that's something that we, we can all do tomorrow or today. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jose. And, you know, we always hear again and again, it's a pipeline problem. Um, John, why do you think that continues to be an excuse? And John, maybe you could also talk a little bit about the uh, Mayor Daly's new initiative program and the Aerial Community Academy, because that's such an extraordinary example of creating a pipeline at the very youngest ages. Well, well thanks for asking about that, uh, Carrie. Uh, about 25 years ago, we created the Aerial Community Academy when uh, former Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan was working at Aerial. And it's a small public school, all union teachers. Uh, it's not a charter school, but it's been a terrific uh, place for us to be able to create a, a robust financial literacy curriculum, which is enhanced by the idea that we give each of the classes a $20,000 class gift. So the kids get to watch us manage that money for the first six years from first grade to sixth grade. And then the kids start to pick real stocks with real money in the sixth, seventh and eighth grade. So we've had many of the, the graduates from the Aerial Community Academy work as summer interns at Aerial, as full-time employees at Aerial. Uh, many have gone into the financial services industry because not only are they learning how to pick stocks and do research and learn about the markets and you know be a part of a future pipeline, they're learning again so much about careers in financial services when they come downtown and they see people like Melody Hobson as the co-CEO and myself as the chief investment officer, people that look like them uh, doing this job, I think we think it can be inspiring for them. So the Aerial Community Academy, we're quite proud of and we're hoping that other financial services companies can partner with urban public schools in the same way that we have. Uh, I chaired a task force for President Obama on financial literacy and that was our recommendation uh, to the president at the time. The other thing I would say is we've become a pipeline for talent too at Ariel. When we have our small firm here, we have 100 employees, but uh, graduates from our program or people who've been a part of Ariel have gone on to do really great things in financial services. And we have two of our former employees are, are now on the management committee at the Northern Trust Bank. Um, Jason Tyler, the CFO, and Chandran Thomas, who's got a major leadership role in the asset management division. But we've had many, many others go off and start their own private equity firms, their own long-only firms, and to do really well. So I think we have a strong minority-owned firm. We do create a pipeline for future talent, which we think is an important thing for all of us to do. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, Tom, tell us a little bit more about, uh, can you give us a concrete example of a company or an investment that you've seen actually create change on on these issues? Um, well, you know, we've been, you know, as an example in terms of, of pressing on boards of directors uh, with shareholder resolutions, I think we're up to about uh, 35 agreements. You know, not every shareholder resolution goes to a vote. Uh, so it's a whole list of companies that have agreed to change, you know, their policies in terms of, of how they source board members, how they approach uh, the nominating process. Uh, you know, so I would point to that, you know, that's one area of, uh, of success that we've had. And, you know, just picking up on, on something both John and, 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 and Jose uh, touched on, uh, you know, what we have seen uh, is that it's such an important point from an investment perspective. These, when we do investments with diverse managers, it has not harmed our performance and, and in many ways has uh, enhanced performance, particularly with 
a diverse emerging managers, and, and I'm glad, Carrie, you, you made the distinction, although most of our emerging managers are diverse, it has often given us exposure to niche markets that our traditional relationships, you know, frankly, haven't had. And, and, and as we're looking forward, you know, those who've, who've been in touch with us know that we allocate money and mandates uh, to, to partners that then source opportunities in all of our uh, major asset classes. We are looking, uh, since we've had so many successes, and I don't want to single any of them out because I'll get in trouble for who I would choose, we have graduated people from uh, and firms from the Emerging Manager Program into the main part of the portfolio. What we're also seeing now, as, as some of those who've even graduated from Emerging Manager to the regular portfolio, MWB firms, talent within their ranks, picking up what John said, they want to start their own firms, create their own opportunities. So we are looking to do more uh, co-investment uh, opportunities. Not that we're going to uh, move away from fund-to-fund relationships that have worked well for us, but we are going to look for more of those kinds of, of, of direct uh, investment opportunities and take advantage of the changing marketplace. So given all the dislocation that's going on right now uh, in the aftermath of COVID-19 and, and the volatility in the markets, there are a lot of credit opportunities. So we're, we're really looking at how we can have a new platform that in terms of, of, of um, credit opportunities with, with firms, looking for that to be a new area where we could seed uh, and hopefully create new opportunities for diverse managers, black and Latino uh, managers in that space as well. So we we have a lot of successes. I don't want to single too many, but uh, but it's a long list. Suffice it to say. Okay, thanks, thanks, Tom. And I just want to say, you know, I, I had uh, dinner last night with my cousin Ted Kennedy Jr. And he has, as a result of the Compass Conference, has started this initiative for investors around disability rights. And um, that, and Tom, you have really been the leader in the country on that uh, in for public funds. So I just really want to acknowledge that and, and thank you on behalf of Teddy and our entire family. And that's an important part, of course, of, of uh, diversity as well. Um, Jose, you... Uh, you made it. My gosh. <laughs> Congratulations. You are in the super big leagues. But when I met you, which was only maybe six years ago, you were, uh, you know, you were struggling emerging manager in a room of 40 or 50 emerging managers sitting around a table at the Milken conference when we met. And uh, um, how did you break out? Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's been an overnight success that's taken about 15 years, um, but <laughs> it's been a good, it's been a good journey. You know, I think, um, I think a few things, right? You know, we, we certainly, I feel like we, we had a good strategy, a strategy that was able to take into account, you know, some of the, some of the complexities of the economy, the volatility that we're seeing in the market. Um, I think we had, we have focused on building a good team. Some of that has been uh, related, very closely related to the conversation we're having, right? You know, I mean, we have a team that is very diverse, uh, and and that that's not necessarily um, that is something that has just emerged or has uh, occurred because we're trying to find the best talent out there. And I think I happen to think again very strongly that that talent is uh, very much equally. Uh, distributed in our society, and and the best thing for our society is to kind of nurture that talent. Um, we wouldn't be here uh, without the help, honestly, of you know, kind of investors uh, like New York Common and others. You know, and and some of our early capital was coming from actually those emerging manager uh, uh, pockets. Um, but I think that you know the the other thing is that we have at at a, a different points in time, we have been willing to take on partners, we have been willing to, uh, for the sake of, of the enterprise, for the sake of building the business, we have made some sacrifices. And I think those sacrifices have paid off. Uh, and ultimately, I think it's about performance. Listen, I think we, we can have this conversation. Um, and it's a very important conversation, but it's incumbent upon us, right? You know, the, the, the folks that have been able to get capital uh, from institutional investors, we need to perform. Uh, and I think, luckily now you have 10, 
20 years of history and data that do indicate um, that diverse teams make better decisions. Um, and again, this is not about Clear Lake, this is just more generally um, that bringing different perspectives into a situation is actually helpful, particularly investing where you know, you're always dealing with uncertain um, uh, situations and you're always dealing with incomplete information um, and having people from different perspectives, uh, different backgrounds, help make better decisions, particularly you couple that with good process and good culture. Uh, and we have been very fortunate. Uh, and, and I think because of that, I feel it's so important, you know, like John and, 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 and Tom were talking about that we give back. And one of the things that we're doing very directly, I'm doing very directly is investing, you know, my own personal capital from my family office into diverse uh, underrepresented minorities and, and female led uh, investment firms. Uh, and we have devoted, my wife and I have, you know, committed, oh, uh, about $50 million to other managers. So, you know, kind of in terms of extending the ladder, passing it on, uh, I feel very strongly that that's another way of continuing to build the pipeline. And we're gonna continue to do that. Uh, and I think it's not, it's, it's, not a, it's not charity, by the way. I fully expect that we're making the right decisions and these managers are gonna multiply that capital and we can do it again and again, recycle it back into the community and do it again and again. But I do feel uh, very fortunate to, to, be, to be here, to be here with you, to have this platform. And like you said, it was not that long time ago that we were uh, you know, just one more you know, kind of smaller manager trying to make it. And you know, we still are, by the way, we're still working as hard as, uh, as ever, uh, but we have been very fortunate to get more capital and, and that our investment results have been uh, quite good. And, um, and let me just add your your incredible gift to Princeton, the largest gift in the history of Princeton University uh, from a uh, a uh, Latinx or maybe a diverse alumni. Is that is that right, Jose? Uh, it's the it, time of the announcement. That was right, but but I have to <laughs> also give a lot of props to. Uh, to John's uh, partner, uh, Melody, uh, which I think uh, it's it's undisclosed amount, but I think there's some s s very comparable, perhaps uh, larger uh, investments uh, or, or donations to to my alma mater. But yes, you know, my wife is at Princeton. Um, Princeton has been uh, really interesting, you know, kind of part um, participant in this discussion about you know, particularly after the George Floyd uh, murder, you know, about. Uh, things like naming rights, right? You know, you go to some of these old universities and mm -hmm. some buildings and some institutions that are named after folks that perhaps were, you know, not necessarily representative of what uh, the values of, of what those institutions would like to embody and would like to represent, you know, and I think uh, we have been part of that conversation, for example, at Princeton with the Woodrow Wilson School, which is no longer the Woodrow Wilson School. It's, uh, it's just a school of uh, public policy, international affairs. Um, but one of the things, that I think it, it, it's related to this Princeton gift, you know, and, and for those of you that don't know, I, I, we, my wife and I donated some capital and, you know, that's gonna go to housing uh, dorms, you know, for, for colleges. And part of that is a part of the initiative of the university to expand the student body and to have more access to people from very diverse backgrounds. By the way, it doesn't have to be only black or, you know, underrepresented minorities. We're talking about, you know, people maybe, you know, a, a white kid from a farming community in Kansas that may not have had the opportunity before. So very much focused on socioeconomic diversity. Um, but one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that, you know, kind of as I have grown you know, to your earlier questions about some of the things that be important for Clear Lake, I think there's a the role models. Having somebody to look up to is very important. And it's not only a direct mentor, the mentorship is very important, but it's also people that look or you can identify with that you can say, wow, you know, he did it. Uh, and, and that could be the path, my path as well. And I think when you walk into a place like Princeton and you see names like Rockefeller and Forbes and other names that have been there for a long time, uh, I do think, and I, at least I would like to think, that in addition to providing more access to people of other socioeconomic backgrounds, there might be a young kid out there that's black or brown that sees, well, gee, you know, there's this building called uh, Ponce Jones for my wife or Jose mm -hmm. and, and and kind of you feel more at home, you feel like you belong, and you be, and you feel also that you can achieve or surpass that type of uh, success yeah. and achievement. Yeah. And that's what I want, you know, to create that type of situation. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Jose. And I just, to that point, you know, everybody always talks about leadership, but 
you can't lead unless there's a follower. So you need the leader and you need the follower and then you need the second follower. And that's how you really start to create a crowd and momentum. And um, all three of you are such extraordinary leaders in your own right, but you uh, have the humility as well to acknowledge that you're also followers. And um, that is that makes that, that makes being a follower something admirable and something we can all aspire to do. So um, we we hope we can follow follow your lead in uh, in this important work you're doing. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all of your help with everything we do with the RFK Human Rights. Um, these are uh, three men who do not know the word no in in my uh in my experience with them so <laughs> thank you again and and can you say yeah oh yeah Karen, I to say one quick thing if you talked about leadership uh, you know congressman kennedy and congressman cleaver have making making an enormous difference with the letters that they've sent out to the major endowments in this country and the leadership in congress now with joyce Beatty and and uh, Maxine Waters, it's really made a difference to see those dynamic political leaders uh, joining forces with people like Tom DiNapoli to uh, really oh, make a thanks. difference for all of okay. us. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for pointing that out. And uh, and I will, um, I'll let no Joe know that, that you said that too. It was really very, very, very much appreciated.